for the introduction. I'm not feeling very well today, so I'm sorry if you can't hear me very well. Um, I'm Thai from Google Security, and I'm here to present to you uh, Project Breacher Proof. Um, so at Google, we, I have 50 minutes, so I will talk very quickly so that we have some minutes for the question and answer. Um, at Google, we use crypto in many, many products. <coughs> um, and I think this uh, image captures how we do product crypto at Google very well. So most of the time, a product team uh, wants to do some, want to implement some, uh, you know, security or privacy features, and they come to us and ask us to develop that feature for them. So what we do is we look at the feature, we develop a protocol, for example, if they want to do, you know, end-to-end -end encryption, or they want to do store encryption, or they want just to want to size some URLs. Then uh, we design and implement this protocol for them, and the protocol are usually built on top of uh, internal uh, robust APIs that we develop in-house. Uh, these APIs basically implement the, you know, the common crypto operation, like uh, authentication encryption, signature, or hybrid encryption. Um, and these ABIs, in turn, are built based on you know, third-party open-source crypto libraries like OpenSSL, uh, OpenJDK, Parsi Castro. I, I name these libraries just because we use them. It's not because they are, you know, they are better or worse than all the libraries. <clears throat> the problem is, um, we usually find that this library usually have a lot of bugs, and these bugs happen for you know a long time, and they repeat themselves very frequently. Like uh, there are bugs that you know that should be fixed 10 or 14 years ago, 15 years ago, but some, somehow they are not. And um, when we look at the libraries, we, we were very surprised. And another problem is we find out that. It's very hard to write, you know, good crypto implementation guidelines for smart, even smart software engineers. They don't have the necessary background to, you know, basically implement crypto correctly. And getting crypto correctly requires, like, you know, digesting decades worth of, you know, academic papers. And <clears throat> of course, we secure the engineer can review the libraries manually ourselves, but that is not scalable because there are lots of libraries out there. Another major problem we have is um, we find out that sometimes we file a bug, we fix them in our internal copy, and then we report it upstream, get them fixed in upstream, and then only to see them coming back when we upgrade our internal version to a new version of the external library. Like, and regression like that really, really hurt because we can't just go back and review every single changes to the libraries. So there should be a better approach. And, and with those observations, uh, we, we have, we recognize that basically software engineers, they prevent and fix bugs by using unit testing. And we think that, you know, crypto issues most many crypto issues can basically resolve by the same means. So these observations have prompted us to develop Project Wager Proof, uh, which is basically a set of open source unit tests that the tests check the crypto libraries for known problems or some expected behavior. And so far, we have like more than 80 unit tests. Um, and when we run the test against the libraries that we use, we found like more than 40 bucks. Uh, we have tests for, you know, elliptical crypto, as a Diffie Harmon authentication encryption or a big integer agreement. Most of the tests are defense in depth. Basically, uh, we want to make sure that uh, the libraries expect in the right way. Sometimes we don't check, rather than just checking for exploitability. We just want to make sure that, you know, for example, uh, default values are reasonable. For example, like uh, today, when you run the test, uh, we, uh, the test would 
uh, we consider, consider it's not okay for a library to generate as a key with, uh, like, you know, with a default value of uh, 10, 24 bits, or using DSA, a digital signature with using SAR1 as default. And, and <clears throat> there are many, many more tests in, in, you know, where we check that the library actually uh, don't, are not vulnerable to, for example, timing uh, side channel. Uh, we also release uh, our out-of-the-box test runners for the libraries that we use, like Fuzzy Cacho, Spongy Cacho, and OpenJDK. Um, uh, our goal is to make it very easy for the user to run a command line and to be able to test the latest version or some particular version of the libraries that we support. Um, so, any questions so far? So, in the next two slides, I will show you some of the, you know, cool bugs that we found. Um, the first one is the um, key recovery um, in OpenJDK's DSA's implementation. So, uh, I think these bugs were fixed in April last year. Uh, the problem here is um, the, the DSA implementation actually allows, uh, if you look, look at the red line, uh, um, the, the sign object is used with a, a, you know, a private key uh, with like 20, 48 bit. The problem is if you, if you, um, if you use, if you initialize the signature object like this, uh, OpenJDK will always generate the nonce using 160 bit only. That means uh, the nonce is uh, heavily biased. Bias. That means you can easily recover using like latex techniques the private key just by observing two to like three to five signatures. And this is a critical problem because DSA is still, is still used a lot in many, many other places. Uh, any question about this bug? The second bug is also a key recovery in uh, Fuzzy Cacho, EC, uh, Diffie, elliptical diffie The C in uh, the last C stands for cofactor, basically. Uh, when they compute a shared secret, they multiply with the cofactor. And if you look at the red line, the way they, mo they compute the shared secret is they take the private key, which is key dot get D, which is the private key of the um, receiver, and they reduce it modulo the order of the public key, which is under the attacker control. That means, you know, we can change, like the attacker, the X509 standard allows the attacker to change the order of the public key. So we can change the order of the public key and to binary search for the private key because we can tell whether the private key is larger than the order and then we can reduce the change the order to see, like to finally nail down the range of the private key. And it just took like, I don't know, like a few requests, like maybe a, a hundred, hundred requests to recover the, the private key. So um, these, these are the two like, I think coolest bugs that we found, but there are so many, many other bugs. Like uh, uh, you can look at the, our project on GitHub and, and, and I think in last week, Fuzzy Castro just released the, next, the latest version and they fixed like eight or nine bugs that we filed and reported to them. So uh, working on, you know, way to proof allows us to basically to understand, you know, how, what, what text, it, uh, like how a good workflow library should look like. And one of the things that we, we've observed is there are not a lot of like, you know, good crypto libraries out there. Um, for example, we have uh, crypto libraries that uh, ask user for retoker input. Like, if you want to encrypt something, you have to pass in a random number generator. And it's impossible to test those libraries because even though if we test the library, the user can easily screw up by passing in an insecure random number generator. 
we also find out that most of the libraries out there don't actually allow users to switch the algorithms when easily. So if you switch the algorithm, you have to you know, start from scratch, from scratch. And the ciphertext encrypted with the old algorithms won't be compatible with the new, like won't, won't be decrypted, won't be able to decrypt it by the new software. Uh, another property that we want to, sh to see in you know, crypto libraries is it should be easy to look at the code and understand right away the crypto properties guaranteed by the, the libraries. Like for example, uh, if you are using um, authenticated encryption, and it should be very easy to look at the code and understand right away without having to navigating you know, the whole structure of the library to, to, to go down the abstraction layer to understand you know, um, what's in the properties guaranteed by the library. Another problem that we saw is uh, we would like to have to see like, you know, the crypto com community to develop a common crypto interfaces for C++, Python, Go, or JavaScript. We have something for Java, which is the Java uh, photography architecture, but we don't have anything for these languages. And it's very hard for us to write tests without having a common crypto interfaces. We actually, right now what we do is we try to translate most of our unit tests into text vectors, uh, into raw text vectors, so that like, people can easily port them to other languages or platforms. But it would be nice to have like, one single set of, you know, just, just to write the test once, and we can run it everywhere. Um, here's other few uh, useful, uh, useful links that you can look up on the source code documentation have been released on GitHub. We also have a mailing list uh, where we take, you know, request support. Like, if you want to test something, or if you want to, um, you know, if you want to run the test against some particular libraries that we don't support, like, please email us, and we will take a look and see if we can support you. Um, the mailing list also is the place where we discuss, like, you know, what's go, what the new updates, the major, major tests that we are going to release in the next few months. Uh, so we are actively working on adding more tests. And um, not only for primitives, we also want to test like protocols, like, uh, you know, SSL, or <clears throat> like, you know, JSON uh, web encryption. You know, we, we look at those libraries and we found lots of problems. So we want, and those libraries are getting very, very popular these days. So we want to, like to make sure that we can test them and making sure that we can, you know, uh, help the developers to fix the, you know, the issue. Uh, most of the tests that we released, uh, we have been working with, uh, you know, Basic Cache, OpenJDK, uh, to integrate these tests into their, you know, CI system so that they can avoid, you know, regression. Um, I think that's it for my presentation of this is the people working on uh, the library, or the, the project. Um, all of us are from uh, Google security team, but we welcome external contribution. Um, I think so far we have got like at least a few PR requests uh, from external people, so please keep it coming. Keep them, like, you know, send us, send us anything that you want to improve in the project. <coughs> yep, that's it. Thank you. Um, if you have any, uh, I think we still have like five minutes for questions and answer. If you have any comments or anything that you want to test, uh, and like I want to have a commercial break. <laughs> My team is hiring, and if you really interested in building and breaking, you know, crypto used in products that used by billions of people, like please talk, come and talk to me, or send your resume to to, to my email address. Thank you. Okay, so we do have some time for questions, and I see somebody at the mic, so take it away. Uh, hello, interesting talk. Uh, I'm Yao Qi from National University of Singapore. So one quick question. Uh, so suppose the, the open source library like OpenSSL uh, fix a bug with some patches, how long does Google take to update the software on the user's client side? 
uh, you, you mean like uh, how long we update the yes. internal copy? No, not internal copy. Like uh, deliver the the software to all the client side users. Uh, I th I'm not sure I'm the right person to answer this question. I think probably Adam and Emilia is are the right person to answer this question. But basically, I think we try to push the updates to the client user, like to to our user before we release, you know, the information on the vulnerabilities or the bugs. So if you see a release, if you see a, a vulnerability release or adversary, you, usually like the box, uh, like the box has been fixed in the user machines already. I see. So yeah. there is a very short window for the attacker to attack your software. Um, I'm not sure it's the case because sometimes um, the time it takes for like it takes us very small, like I think it's, it should take a very short amount of time to fix the vulnerability, but the time it takes from the the people who find the vulnerability to report it to us, maybe during that window, uh, somebody else have you know um, got like their hands on the knowledge of the vulnerability, but it it should be very 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 quickly, and the windows and we we do our best to mention to make sure that the window is very small, like maybe a few days. I see. <clears throat> Thank you. Yep. Hello. Uh, thanks very much for doing this work because it looks really interesting. Um, Thank you. And I had a question about, you had a bullet point there about switching algorithms by applications and I'm wondering if you can kind of expand on that a little bit and talk about what exactly the problem is that you're trying to solve with that and what that exactly means. Yeah, it's just an observation. Like uh, when we look at the crypto libraries, in, you know, open source crypto libraries, we found out that like most libraries don't allow users to switch the algorithms easily. Like for example, if you have, if you use encryption, like if you have a bunch of data, you encrypt the data and you send, like for example, you encrypt some URL parameters, and you you send those parameters around the world and they are embedded in links that are publicly, you can't change the ciphertext anymore. And now you find out that, oh, the algorithm that you are using may not be very strong and you want to switch to something else. The problem is when you want to do that, you, most of the time you can't decrypt this, the own ciphertext anymore. And that's a, a big problem, right? Because you want to be able to be able to still like, decrypt like your, core, like your own ciphertext, your current ciphertext, without having to, you know, to, I don't know, like uh, to completely rewrite your your application. Right. So most of the time, I, I think it boils down to uh, basically you have to making sure that uh, the ciphertext contains some metadata about the key that you use to encrypt, you know, to generate the ciphertext. And and there are some like uh, techniques that you can use to do like very simple idea like you can embed a key ID or something into the ciphertext. Uh, but some standards actually uh, instead of embedding a key ID, they they do like things like they embed the key ID as well as some algorithm parameters about the like that that are used to generate the ciphertext like the key ID algorithm. And uh, like for example, if you look at JSON web encryption standards, they have key ID, uh, the algorithm that we use, and then some other parameters. And I think that is wrong because you shouldn't do that because you just specify the key ID, and the key ID should be should be bound to all of those properties. So when you look at the key ID, you have all the information in your configuration to right. like decrypt or verify the ciphertext. Right, so basically what you're saying there is that, you know, because most crypto designers, protocols, and APIs are looking to prevent downgrade attacks, for example, so they actually limit options deliberately. Uh, so it sounds to me like you're talking about techniques that both avoid these kind of attacks, right. but also provide yep. this ability to switch algorithms. Yep. yep. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, is, is it a quick question? Yes. Okay. So on slide two, I noticed something very interesting. The APIs you're providing to developers implement very basic things like encrypting, authenticating encryption, mm -hmm. and yet you use libraries written for these purposes, mm -hmm. and apparently the APIs aren't suitable at all. 
Uh, sorry? Apparently, the APIs those libraries provide can't be exposed for this purpose. So why, what's the benefit from using those libraries? Why should there be a plurality of libraries that all don't work instead of one that does work and provides the right algorithm so you don't make this mistake of using the wrong algorithm with an API that's easy to use? So, uh, so if you look at crypto libraries, there are, uh, I think, several levels, like low-level libraries like OpenSSL, OpenJDK, Basicasho, they provide you, they provide us the primitives, like, you know, uh, AES, um, elliptic curve, Diffie-Hellman, all of those primitives. But if we let the programmers to use those libraries directly, usually they use wrong. So what we want to do is we want to give them a kind of a mid-level library that abstract away the common crypto operation in, in, in that we see that, that are deployed in many, many use cases. So, and those applications, that those common crypto operations are usually just four operations, like authentication encryption, Mac, hybrid encryption, and digital signature. There are other things like determin deterministic encryption, but they are less popular than those four primitives. So what we do is we develop those, you know, primitives, uh, those interface, and provide our programmers, our developers, those interface. Of course, we don't let them to use those interface directly either. In order to use them, we ha they have to talk to us because most of the time we want to make sure that they use the right primitive for the right application. So th does that answer your question? Thank you. We're already uh, running slightly behind time, so Rich. So I suggest any further questions, we take them to the break. But let's thank Ty one more time. Thank you, Ty. Thank you. <laughs>